Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com runs down the major markets. They appear to be in correction mode with next week expected to be a make it or break it time. Ross takes a look at crude, gold, the U.S. and Canadian dollars, and Bitcoin. InsideTrackTrading.com president Eric Haddock examines some of the cycles in the stock market, the U.S. dollar, interest rates, gold, crude, and geocosmic events. Noted West Vancouver realtor Alan Mark Angel tells us last year was not the record setter in real estate organized land sellers say it was. He takes a look at what's been happening with Vancouver's trend-setting properties. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have a company showcase update from American Manganese president Larry Ray. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can find him on Twitter at ChartsbyRoss. Welcome back to the show, Ross. Good to be with you, Jim. Ross, uh, the stock market's all ending in the red on Friday. What kind of a start to the month have we had? Uh, well, this is, uh, I guess this is the second worst that you can have. The worst, actually, is that you start off January with a breakout and then fail on the breakout. And that, that typically ends up with a, uh, a 10 to 11% drop by mid-February. In our case, um, all the major indices, uh, just basically at the first of the month, flirted with the December highs, couldn't uh, put on any strength through there. And normally, uh, when you get that kind of a pattern, you're going to see an initially a, a, a six to eight percent decline. And as of Friday, um, that's uh, that's in place here. We've got uh, pretty much uh, seven or eight percent moves down uh, in the broad in, in the S and P and the Dow. Um, Nasdaq is worse, and you know uh, clearly any of the uh, the high flyers, the stocks with the high PD ratios are typically down anywhere from, well, I guess 30 to 50 percent. Some of these, you, know, you take a look at the, the, the Shopify's, the Netflix's, um, it's just been a devastating, uh, week right now, which means that, you know, on the month, it's a devastating one. So the key here to be watching for is that, you know, we've been in this big super cycle since 2009. And um, if this is similar to the other well, four super cycles that we've had in the last century, the initial break um, usually will hold around an 11% decline. And the key will be the bounce that happens out of there. Uh, you know, if you look at the... Uh, the 1929, you look at 1973, um, you look at 2000, all of those, uh, you got that initial break and you got um, a recovery that was 60 to 70 percent, but then started stepping its way back down again. So um, the uh, initial support, probably going to see that next week, probably going to see some capitulation levels. Um, our uh, modeling that we use for capitulation um, kicked in a few uh, individual stock signals in the last week, but not the type of thing that you would see at an important low like we had in March of 2000 or on the break uh, back in uh, January, February of 2018. So even though this is a hard break this week, uh, we're probably still at least a few days away from any kind of an interim low. You know, and maybe that becomes a turnaround Tuesday effect where, you know, the market gets uh, some follow through on Monday, uh, gets the, the real panic out of the way, and you might get a bounce out of that. So, uh, you know, we've been led to the downside by these um, high flyers, uh, and um, now it's spread across so that uh, I guess we finish the week here with 
um, <laughs> the Treasury bonds is about the only item uh, having a decent day. What's going on with crude? Um, crude oil, we got um, some um, uh, retest of the high up at $86 this week. Um, and most of the indicators are now up into some pretty good overbought territories. So I wouldn't be at all surprised uh, to see crude back off. Uh, close the week uh, around 84 and a half. Probably looking at somewhere in the high 70s as a pullback. And if you look at uh, the, the stocks, uh, things like the, uh, the XLE on the U.S. or the XCG in Canada for the ETF, those clearly at this point are uh, ready for uh, a decent correction. We haven't had one um, since that November low when the oil market had that 11% break. And so um, normally at this point, um, you'd see a good 50% recovery. Uh, or uh, uh, retracement, and as far as the, uh, the XLE is concerned, that would be just a test of the uh, the October high. So let's see what happens uh, when it gets down there. Um, to say you get you know, a few of these good opportunities um, throughout the year, and uh, the last one was right at the end of November. So we'll have patience, uh, looking for this one to settle back down from where it is. What's going on with the precious metals? A uh, big pop in the middle of the week. Um, the, uh, the key for us had been that uh, if, uh, you know, to uh, have had that December low and have any uh, chance for a rally, you needed to see uh, the first two weeks of January um, take out the highs. So managed to do that on uh, Wednesday, a little follow through on Thursday, but nothing on Friday. So um, gold trading around 1830, it's going to need to hold um, the, uh, probably the 1815 to 1820 range to maintain this uptrend that it's in right now. Silver was a um, big surprise on the upside, managed to get up uh, to uh, 24 and a half. Uh, so that was a pretty good run. And um, look for that one. Uh, I still think... Um, the, it's it's under going to underperform just because the way I see it reacting relative to other commodities. So for all that this was a decent week, um, I think that silver has yet to uh, prove that uh, a major bottom is in. What's going on with the U.S. and Canadian dollars? Uh, on the currency side, uh, we're looking at uh, the Canadian dollar. Has did fairly well here. Um, you know, we mentioned last week and the week before that it was rallying with commodities and um, doing better than we had been seeing uh, during November and into early December. So um, as uh, as things have come unwound here in terms of most of the uh, investment vehicles this week, the Canadian dollar uh, took a little bit on the nose, uh, trading down around 79 and a half after being up uh, around 80.20. Uh, still uh, see this as um, buoyant right in here. There's a, a decent looking base in the last uh, six weeks or so, so uh, um, support around just just under the 79 cent level, I think, uh, might be appropriate. On the crypto front, what's going on? Uh, we had uh, what we thought was a really nice uh, short-term buy signal a week and a half ago, uh, just around 40000 Uh There was a 10% bounce, which in most uh, items would be considered a pretty good bounce, but 10% in Bitcoin really isn't much, and 40000 up to 44. And uh, all it did was get up to uh, its very uh, initial resistance level, couldn't even get up to the secondary ones. Uh, tested its 20-day moving average. It's uh, now uh, back uh, under 40,000. And, uh, you know, we had thought that uh, the key levels would be around 40, and the next one probably closer to 20,000. So, um, you know, um, this this is one that, uh, gosh, you know, this has really been out of favor uh, since the 1st of November. and That was a double top relative to... Uh, the peak that we had seen back in April. So at this point, uh, I would say unless you can see Bitcoin uh, get above 44,000, 
the uh, the odds are that uh, the uh, the old uh, downtrend of the last three or four months uh, will continue to uh, be in force. Ross, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Always a pleasure to be with you, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. You can find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Coming up, Eric Haddock, next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Eric Haddock, CEO and President of InsideTrackTrading.com. Welcome back to the show, Eric. Oh, well, thanks for having me back, Jim. It's my pleasure. Eric, precious metals, uh, are they in a cyclic move or something that was unexpected because gold and silver have gone up uh, in the past few days? Uh, they're definitely adhering to the cycles that we've been talking about now for, for several months. Uh, back in third quarter of last year, I was explaining how late September, early October was the convergence of just a, a myriad of monthly and weekly and even yearly cycles when you looked at things like uh, the, the mining share indexes, the gold bugs index, uh, which had had a consistent three-year cycle between lows in, in the precise month of September. And uh, that, that those lows that had been seen even in September 2015, September 2018, uh, were coming together with a lot of other cycles. And I suppose that's something I, it's always good for me to emphasize or reiterate. I would never be discussing a particular time frame if there wasn't a great synergy of cycles. So it's, you know, even though I'm mentioning this three-year cycle right now, there was a, a preponderance of these cycles that I laid out in my publications for my readers coming into play in late September, early October. And that's when I was expecting at least a three to six month and probably a six to 12 month bottom in precious metals. And the way they had been trading in, in lockstep with uh, particular weekly cycles leading into that time frame. I even laid out a little bit of a uh, scenario in the ensuing months where the, I thought the first rally would lead into mid-November, and that was a seven-week rally. And from there, it was indicating that we should see a, a sequence of in higher highs on an intermediate basis on, on the seven-week interval. And so the outlook was for a rally into mid-November, a pullback. Uh, gold had significant support at 1760. That's where it was expected to bottom. It bottomed right around there in early December, then again mid-December. And that was forecast to uh, spur an initial rally into the first couple days of January, then a little bit of consolidation, then a stronger rally into first into the week of January 31st to February 4th, when I think we'll see a, a short-term peak. And then I'm looking for a more significant peak a little bit later in February. And it's all based on... <clears throat> A lot of timing indicators, both what I refer to as cycles, but also there are weekly and monthly technical indicators that have timing uh, in, in, integrally integrated into their makeup. So it's both price and time, certain price levels needing to be hit by certain time frames, and they help to hone these cycles down to very precise timing. So last week, um, January 14th, 
Uh, the gold and silver had shown that they were, it consolidated long enough, they were ready to break out. So in my January 15th weekly relay, I explained why uh, gold and silver had had consolidated enough and now look for them to break out higher uh, during this current week, January 17th to the 21st, and then accelerate higher into the end of the month. So that's where we stand on a short-term basis, but there are some very unique things setting up in in several of the metals, including ones like platinum and palladium, that have been showing the uh, the magnitude and the significance of this this upturn in metals, and and showing that it could have some um, more longevity to it than um, than some of the recent rallies. The U.S. dollar. Uh, has this been uh, the go-to currency for people worried about a downturn in the markets? I, I think there's been uh, several reasons that have supported the dollar, even going back to um, last year when that perception began to shift that interest rates had bottomed out and then eventually quantitating Quantitative easing would would end or, or be scaled down greatly. That bond purchases would be scaled back, and that that rates would ultimately begin to rise. And even when that perception just became a blip on the radar, you saw action in the in the dollar start to react to that action in bonds and notes. And it's always the mar- markets are always about anticipation not when the event's actually finally happening. And so you've seen the dollar slowly build up and break through some key resistance levels at the end of last year, confirming that a a multi-year low is probably in place. I actually think that the dollar is at the point where it could see a little bit of a correction in here, uh, but from there I'm still looking for higher levels later on in the year. Now, with the stock markets, uh, have are we seeing a topping out process, or will they take a little dip and then start climbing for the sky again? Well, since uh, the the latter part of last year, I've been explaining why I thought early January would time a significant peak in in a lot of the indexes, and that we would get an initial sell off in January then probably a rebound into late January, early February. And depending on how and where that rebound peaks out, we could be in an even more vulnerable uh, state as the month of February and even part of March unfold. So there's a couple of key indicators that need to be triggered in order to validate or reinforce that scenario, in fact, Right now, as we're coming into the uh, weekly close on January 21st, that's going to be one of these key time time windows where a lot of specific weekly indicators could turn negative and begin to reinforce that outlook that I'm talking about. So I'm going to be watching the January 21st close very closely with regard to some of these intermediate indicators that that I'm watching, but I think that there's even much bigger, longer-term cycles coming into play in 2022 that could time a, a much more significant peak, even though it doesn't mean that this, the one we're going through right now, is that 2022 peak, um, but I think that there are a lot of very long-term cycles that I have um really detailed and elaborated in uh, the last couple issues of my Inside Track newsletter. And it, it all puts the focus on 2022 as the time for a potential major top in the equity markets. But as I said, that's, that those yearly cycles uh, are not necessarily the same as this initial peak that I was expecting in early January of 2022. So for right now, I think that we are actually coming into a couple of day period right around January 20th when you could see an initial low in the equity markets. It's interesting, and this is 
what I would consider a 30-day, 30 30-degree, 30 one-month cycle. But if you look at every month since May of last year, and of those seven, eight months, uh, if, you, if you include January now, we'll see if that uh, holds holds true to form. But in the majority of those months, you've seen a, a lot of the key indexes and many stocks peak in the opening days of the month, usually in the first three to five trading days of the month, and then sell off and set a intermediate bottom. Sometimes it's held for a few weeks and just been kind of an intramonth bottom. Other times it's held for several months after that. But those lows have occurred usually on the 19th or the 20th of the month. So it's been a very consistent pattern. And like I said, this is a a, a 30-day, a one-month cycle that the markets have adhered to. And once again, in January, we've seen the same thing. Uh, a lot of the indexes peaked right in the first couple trading days of the month, have been moving progressively lower since then, and are approaching key downside price targets that also make that timing and that that month-to-month cycle more significant because you've got these price indicators coming into play at the same time. So it's a a good squaring of time and price, uh, if you will. And so it wouldn't surprise me to see a a one- to two-week low set here right around within a day either side of January 20th and then a rebound into the opening days of February. Interest rates, we have central banks around the planet talking about hiking them. Uh, do they follow a cycle? Oh, they have definitely followed a cycle. And, and I know I've discussed it many times with you that from a longer term basis, uh, interest rates and, and the bond and 10 year notes markets have adhered very closely to a four year cycle that most recently timed peaks in July of 2012 and July of 2016, and that's why throughout the uh, latter part of 2019 and early 2020, I kept saying look for a, a major turning point in July of 2020, which is right when we saw our peak in the bonds and, and notes, and that four-year cycle has often broken down into some one-year cycles within each phase of it, and that was... Uh, that had me looking for a secondary top in the bond market, which is low in interest rates. In July of 2021, we got that pretty much in, in, in time and a sell off from there that, that could last into March of this year, uh, sell off in the bonds and, and rebound or rally in the corresponding interest rates. Uh, but I think that uh, those interest rates are that the cycle should continue into 2023 before there is any noticeable pullback in rates and rebound in the bond market. So interest rates have very definitely continued to adhere to that cycle, and I expect them to continue to on a very short-term basis. Uh, Bonds and notes turned negative in mid-December and projected a sell-off into January 20th to the 24th. So I think that we're probably getting very close to a low in bonds uh, from where we should see a a moderate rebound take place. But that's just short-term cycles. What do you see happening with crude oil? Crude is coming into a, a very consistent 15-week cycle that it has adhered to and also a corresponding uh, multi-month cycle that we're all telling me to look for a, a surge into and then a intermediate peak during uh, the middle part of January, which I think will be intact before January 21st. And so I think that we have probably seen the uh, the move up in in all the energy markets, uh, crude and the products, and it's it's time for a a peak to take hold and and some um, some serious correction from there before it would have any chance of 
uh, of another uptrend. Geocosmic events always uh, grab our attention, and I know there's certain cycles that we should pay attention to. Uh, we had that huge volcanic explosion in the South Pacific, and we don't really know what kind of eventual damage was done by it. Uh, did something like that appear on your radar screen? Uh, the exact event, no. The timing, very much so. Um, I did uh, several interviews on uh, earthquake and volcano cycles over the past few years and have also been highlighting it in my newsletters and even my weekly relay publication. But the, um, the gist of it was that um, the cycles that I watch, and I, I have to really uh, emphasize this too because the first thing when you start talking about earthquakes, you'll get people pointing out uh, a very accurate point, and that is there are earthquakes, you know, almost every day around the globe uh, of significance, and there are volcanoes going off um, at almost any point in time. What I look at is the swarms of those those earthquakes and volcanoes, and not just swarms, but they have to be of a certain significant magnitude also, and I've seen going back hundreds of years that you get these, uh, the, this synergy, this close grouping of seismic activity like that in a very consistent interval. And so the conclusions that I came up with were that 2021, 2022 would see an increase in uh, earthquake activity and overlapping that. 2022 to 2024 is when there were a lot of significant volcano cycles that I expected to um, to result in some pretty significant volcanoes over this coming three-year period. Honing that down a little bit, there are a couple time frames in almost any given year where you also see an uptick in this type of activity. And particularly on the uh, Ring of Fire throughout the Pacific. And the, the two most significant are right around mid to late January and mid to late July on a kind of 180-degree opposition on on the map, and or excuse me, on the calendar and, and on the Earth itself. And you will often get a kind of buildup in that, in the weeks that lead up to that, so even in my um, December 15th weekly relay, I, I explained that global quakes were starting to uptick, just as I would expect, and and I put in there that, you know, they continue as the Earth nears the time of year from late December into late January when significant disturbances often hit, and at the same time, this this time around, we were seeing a, a very increased uh, in frequency and intensity of sunspots, which, you know, when they do uh, project those CMEs, those coronal mass ejections, the electromagnetic waves towards Earth, it does upset the magnetic field in the Earth, and so you know, there's bound to be effects reverberating throughout the Earth and throughout its core. And so I was, my main focus was on the mid to late January time frame to see uh, an increase. And actually leading into last week, there was a lot of earthquake activity uh, building up around the globe for the, the weeks leading into that. So that that underwater volcano and the resulting tsunami was certainly right in that time frame when you uh, often see an increase in in that type of seismic activity. So from a timing standpoint, it was no surprise at all. Of course, that, that does not, uh, that type of analysis, those type of cycles do not uh, specify locations or intensities, anything like that. It is certainly a, a more general and broad stroke type of analysis. Eric, before we go, can you uh, tell us a little bit about InsideTrackTrading.com and why I-N-S-I-I-D-E for Inside? 
Well, the the acronym INSIIDE was really determined in the very beginning with the key markets that were being focused on, and and some of that has has spread out a little bit, but each of those letters stood for um, sectors or groupings in the futures markets that that I was focused on at the time, from uh, indexes or excuse me inflation markets, which excuse me, basically included the majority of your commodities, uh, stock indexes, the SI, uh, inflate, uh, excuse me, interest rates was another one of the I's, uh, D was for dollar and related currency, E for energy markets, and so that was the uh, Im- implication of that acronym. But on our website and in our publications, we provide Everything from the broad stroke analysis, like we were just talking about with, with the earth, with sunspots, with social and uh, economic cycles, with war cycles that I know we've talked about before, you and I, uh, down to <clears throat> broader market cycles, where when you're talking about multi-year cycles, like I mentioned in the, in the gold mining shares, you know, a three-year cycle, but then taking it down to more specific, more usable, more practical analysis and trading strategies based on not only cycles. Cycles just lay the foundation and set the backdrop, but there are a wealth of very specific technical indicators and risk management principles that I lay out for my readers that are really the the core and the crux of our services, and that's taking, like I said, that analysis to a a more usable level and also doing it a way that's trying to instruct and educate readers on how a lot of these indicators are calculated, how they're applied, when they're applied, because a lot of indicators, the real key is knowing when to use them and when to just set them aside depending on the type of market you're in. So that gives a little uh, synopsis of what we provide and what is on our website. Eric, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Thanks for having me back, Jim. My guest has been Eric Haddock, CEO and President of InsideTrackTrading.com. He was speaking to us from Central California. Our conversation took place on January 20th. Coming up, Alan Mark Angel next on This Week in Money. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Alan Mark Angel, one of the top realtors in Canada. He has sold more than 4,000 properties. He's located in West Vancouver, British Columbia. And you can find him online at the AngelGroup.com. That's spelled A-N-G-E-L-L Group.com. Alan, welcome back to This Week in Money. I'm extremely happy to be here. Alan, what has happened in the last half of 2021 to real estate on the North Shore and the West Side of Vancouver? Well, I've been a realtor for you know a long, long time, and I got to admit that 2021 was the most unusual years I've ever seen. I just, I was absolutely when I look at the results, uh, I was t- totally surprised and shocked how it could happen that way. There's such a discrepancy in the apartment condo sales compared to the houses. I've never seen anything like it in my career. So what did you see that was uh, so interesting or so shocking? Well, the, the housing market, I mean, yeah. I had all these realtors saying that, oh, we're having a great year and selling houses. One of the top realtors in West Vancouver, he sent out a flyer and he said that we have near record number of sales. And I said, well, he's... he's <laughs> very successful now, but he hasn't got a clue what he, he's talking about. 
I mean, just to give it, the, the house sales are great. Prices prices increased, but the, the total sales, like in West Vancouver, for example, we had 682. The the average the average year. I have all my charts go back to the the average selling is 7.30. So we're basically 50 sales below reaching an average total sales. The top year of all time is over 1,200. So how 682 is your record number of sales, I I have no no idea at all. And it's also the lower mainland, north and Vancouver. Uh, you know, it was just slightly slightly below. The, the average is 12.31, and the, the last year was 11.83. But and, and the best year is twenty one hundred and seventy six. West Side was really interesting. West Side, the average the sales were eleven ninety two. The average is sixteen fifty eight. So they're twenty eight percent below below average, and they're fifty eight percent below the best year of all time twenty eight hundred and thirty one. And so through the greater uh, Vancouver area. Basically, they were they were right on average with thirteen nine hundred eighty three, and the average is thirteen nine hundred fifty six. But the top here of, of all time is twenty two or thirteen thousand nine eighty three to thirteen thousand nine nine fifty six. The top year of all time was twenty two thousand seven hundred. So we're thirty nine beside behind behind the top here there. So it's interesting that. Housing, everybody talked about how great they were, but really, we're just at an average number for total sales. Prices increased qu- quite a bit. And if you're comparing it to 1918 and 19, they're absolutely right, because 1918 was the worst year in history. We, we only had 31, or 321 sales compared to 682, so we're, o- we're over t- twice as much, but that's the worst year. So, Basically, the total number of houses sold in the Lower Mainland were basically around an average number of sales. But prices increased quite a bit. The condo market, on the other hand, was just, it was the best year we ever had, by far. The condo condo market was 29,722. The best year ever was 25, so... We, we were 4,000 plus apartments m- m- more sold this past year than we, we ever had. Each area, each area was like that. West Vancouver, the highest had been 315. We went to 335. North Vancouver was striking. The best year ever was 1856. They went to 2305. So, but the interesting thing about that is that the condo prices basically haven't been doing much. So how can you have the best year you've ever seen? And yet, the the prices haven't changed. But I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. I'm just putting a apartment on the the market right now, and she bought it in 217 for uh, four million, four million six brand new plus all the taxes. So she's in close to four eight. It's going to sell about four three. So there, and I had a, a penthouse downtown that I sold at uh, two sixteen. It was, I mean, it was, a, it was only a three-story wood frame, but he bought it for one nine fifty, and uh, and the sales of it. And I send out charts to my clients about what what the market's doing. He said, well, "I guess it's time to sell." There's so so many more sales. So there were two p- penthouses. The one beside him had just sold the month before. He called me to say it had sold the month before. I checked when it sold for one nine sixty, ten thousand more than he paid for it five years ago. So, the apartment prices haven't changed much, but the house, the house prices certainly have. 218 and not 19 were the, were the worst years in our history. The market probably dropped 25 to 30 to 33% at that time, basically because all the, the taxes the government put, put on and everything else and the bank getting harder. So the market's been climbing. Climbing since really the fall of last year, the reason it started in the fall, we had so fewer houses last year. The inventory was so short because of the virus, and so um, you know we, we didn't have as many people selling or, or buying. So that's why. So the inventory was so short. That's why prices started to increase. In March we had 91 sales in West Vancouver. In March was, was the highest March of all time, but 
then of course we went from we had 268 listings in January to to 488. So of course the market slowed down, but it always slows down in the summertime, picks up a bit a bit in the fall. So basically the strange thing was houses sold to an average amount of sales, and I do every year Maple Ridge, Burnaby. I do I check them all. The only two areas that took the, the big loss were West Side, Richmond area, and some in Vancouver East because the Chinese, I guess, were more, were more concerned about the the virus staying home and not buying or selling. So it hurt it hurt, it hurt the, those area more. But condos, the low end condos, where you had to have m- m- multiple offers on them. But if you get to take away the low end, the other ones didn't go up at hardly at all in price. So it's uh, it's interesting. I've never seen where condos could have the best year in the history, but hardly increase in price. The houses can reach average number of sales, and they increase a lot. So very unusual year. How is the current inventory of homes? Well, that's that that's I love that. It's probably starting off. I I check the areas. I check every year how many houses are on. Uh, on January the first, and then I do. Then I do each month at the end of the month. So when I uh, I look at the January first, uh, first four uh, houses in West Van, two hundred and fifty five active listings. Last year was two sixty eight, which was low, but n- normally they're three hundred forty or fifty. West Van apartments were around a hundred last year, hundred twenty one. We have only. 45 as of January the 1st. West side, 297 houses. The average is probably, oh, 470 or something like that. They have, they have 297 and their apartments. Apartments, there were 1361 last year. They were started at 1,045. Greater than Vancouver area, we had less than 2,000 houses as of January the 1st. Last year was low at 2605, but normally they're 3,500, 4,000. So the inventory all over is low. So we're starting off the year with less product than we've had in years. So I expect that the market's going to continue as it's going because when you don't have the product, people are going to have to, to bid more. But I think there should be, I think there should be a good gain in apartment prices because we, when we only have 45, and I said last January 120, and so I think it's going to be a, a, a good year for selling apartments for sure because they have to have a, a jump in price. Are we likely to see more supply hit the market this year? Yeah, for sure, because it, it always starts off low. By as I said, last year they had 268 houses West Van. Then we went by April, May, we had just out of 500. It'll, it'll, it'll be the same here because there's very little product. Where has the buying been coming from? The, the buyers are, are, are all from where they, they live here now. They're, they're, they're just people who are moving around. That's all it is. You don't get the, the Ford buyers are too tough. They have all, they have to pay all the, you know, basically they have 25% in, in taxes to pay when we have to come from, you know, from overseas. So there's not much sense in buying a four million dollar house and, and, uh, and paying five for it. So that's, it's people, but we have a lot of Chinese, a lot of Persians. I, it's amazing, amazing how it's changed in my career. I used to be, I used to sell so, so many houses in the 80s and 90s because I was the top age, in 1980, I became the top agent in Canada then, but I sold a lot, you know, 125 ends a year because I didn't have the competition from the, the, the Persians or the Chinese realtors. So now our, it's spread up so much that, uh, the top guy will sell 60 houses in West Vancouver instead of over a hundred. The, the interesting market is the, the West side because I can't believe that they're, they're, they are 28% below average number of sales. So uh, I expect there's going to be, once this, that uh, the virus is over with something, we have the, the new virus, but a lot of my staff that what it's a lot like it's a lot like the flu you're not going to die from it you're just going to be sick for two or three weeks so it seems to be that you know we're getting beyond the one where you have to worry about going in the hospital and, and dying but still everybody seems to get to get catch the flu all my clients are my are 
my salespeople who come home from holidays, they've all just seen they're gone through it. So they're off for either a week, ten days, or if it's bad, they're off for two to three weeks. So it, it does change it. It changes. It does change the change the product because there wasn't as many houses on the market as there normally is. People didn't want. You can't blame them. People didn't want. Um, people like I've got a a roof leak all of a sudden. It just with all the snow, I sprung a leak. I was supposed to be going to my place in Honolulu, December fourth and December third. My roof opened up with the snow and they had a leak, and so I couldn't leave the house empty. So I had to cancel my holiday and stay home. But uh, I just had a guy come up and put a cover over because I don't want the, the contractors inside my house. So we, we still have to be cautious. But yes, it has effect, affected us, for, us for sure. And if you follow what's going on in the states, it's nuts down there. It's just a, a, a absolutely insane behavior down there. Did the people who sold their homes buy another home? Yes, they are. yeah. I can't say I've had anybody a long time just. Maybe one in the last two or three years that have just bought and they're going to rebed for a short time. That it, it, this talked about the end, but they end up buying. It's a good that thing they did because I said since since the two eighteen to nineteen where it dropped twenty five to thirty three, that the better got on whatever you're in, it's come back twenty to twenty five percent. So it's a good thing they did buy apartments. Apartments they weren't lucky if they bought apartments, but. I guess is that will change this year. How are West Vancouver waterfront properties selling? Well, they're very interesting because it's uh, it's the ocean fronts. I'm talking from Horseshoe Bay to Lionsgate Bridge, say, and uh, <coughs> they um, they average about seventeen, eighteen sales a year. But the last few years. They've only had eight or nine. This year, we went up to 16 sales. So 216 was the last good year at 14, but we we had 16 this year, so that was great. We're hearing that mortgage rates could be headed higher with or without the bank rate. How interest rate sensitive is the high-end home market, and is it more monetary or psychological? I, uh, the, the interest rates will will, will affect the, the the buyers in the you know an eight hundred to one point two or, or two three. Most of the high end people they they have the cash to buy, but they like to have a more mortgage on their home. They put a fifty percent more mortgage just so they have their their credit. You know, is there? Or if you need some credit, you, you need to investigate them. They know they pay their bills, so I don't think it'll it'll affect the, the high end. Has got a lot stronger. Is 2016 still the peak for high-end home prices in West Vancouver? Well, I'll give you exactly 2016. I like uh, I do two records over seven million and up then, and then uh, and then I go over ten. So in 2016, we had 46 sales over seven. Went down to 218. Went down to 12. Now this last year we had 44. So we had two less than the uh, 16, but over 10. In 216, we had 14 over, over over 10. Went down to four in 218. 19, we didn't have it. We got zero in 219. 2021, we were up to 16. So we were actually two ahead of 216. So that that's a, a good sign. Is mortgage lending at the banks more liberal at the moment? I, th- I think it's soft. It has a, a softened a bit. Yes, I think it's. I mean, you know, the 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 rates are still great and. Uh, I don't think they're they're as strict as the uh, as they were. How much have property tax assessments gone up in the West Vancouver area, and are they an indicator of the market? Well, it's interesting. That it's, uh, I'm one of these real estate nuts. I I just love love my I love my being a realtor. I love my job, and I love my owning an office. But I study everything there is. So just give giving an example. BC assessments. If you look at the sales at two, at two nineteen, seventy one percent were below were, were below assess value. Two nineteen, eighty two percent were were below assess value. Two twenty, twenty two percent were below assess value. 
last year only five percent. Now with the increase, they've increased it. You know, depending on the price range, anywhere from about nine to twenty percent. So now they're all they're all to it. Like I've got a I've got a house I've had on for six five, and I've got offers around six three, six one to six three, and that that's probably where uh, the sessions were six five. But now they're seven one. So now that house is still going to sell at six one six two, and yet the assessments are, are now going to be a million dollars higher than that. So basically, what's happening now, all the assessments are going to be higher uh, higher than what the homes are worth now. In times of inflation, what tends to happen to the prices of real estate? Well, I mean, it it depends the area you live in. Vancouver West Side, West, West Van. I think the the people make enough money to to buy the houses. They you know they have to have a home to live in and things like that. You know that they complain about the gas prices. I had a friend send me a a, a, a picture of a, a gas pump in California. He took the picture of the th- the three grades. You know it's it's a gallon down there, but I was shocked. They talked about how much has gone up down there, but. They were seven forty seven, seven eighty seven, and eight forty nine was the price per gallon on the pump in California. That's absolutely insane. So my car, my car, I used to cost me hundred and twenty five dollars to fill. Now it's one hundred and seventy. So it's got you know it's, it's got up. But I mean, you may not you may try to drive a bit less or do, do, do things like that, but. I think you, you know your home is your most important important asset you have. So as long as you can make some money on your house and you can buy some other one, I don't think it'll it'll, it'll change the real estate market very much uh, unless it keeps going. It goes nuts and nuts. West Vancouver is it a multicultural city, and are different cultures more likely to buy in certain areas? Well. It, it's interesting because I, in my office, I've got guys, you know, I have to, of course I have the Iranian and the Chinese, but I now have a couple of people of um, uh, 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 Africa, Ukraine, uh, other, other areas in the world. And uh, I, I mean, our cultures are totally different, but when you talk to them, get to know them, their life is totally different from ours. But you find, I find like, I, I go through all the sales. I love this business. I work, 12 hours a day at least half of or more of it spent on doing charts like I I go through I break down all the areas in West Vancouver Amoside uh, Dunder Rave you know, Bay Ridge Caulfield Eagle Harbor the Glen Eagles British Properties chart well I check all the sales for last year and I want to see how many Caucasian no, when, I, when I say Caucasian I'm talking about the the European people so all the people that came from Europe here the Chinese and the Persian and it's amazing how it can change from area to area. Where I live at Caulfield, out to to Glen Eagles, and the Caucasians are about eighty percent of the buyers. Yet I can go at the Chartwell area. The Caucasians are about fourteen percent. And so, when I the reason I do do that is because when I list a house, they always ask, "Well, who's going to be the buyer?" So I can say, "Well, here's what it looks like. This area right down." You know, you, we have a 22% will be Caucasian, we have a 40% it'll be Iranian, a 40% will be Chinese, or it can be 80% Caucasian and 7% and 9% or something. So it just helps me be decide, okay, where, where do I have to, if I'm going to sell this place, where do I have to push the house? And it makes sense because if, if you and I move to Iran or somewhere else, we, we'd want to move in the area where people speak our language so, so that they tend to stay there. When the Chinese arrived, they bought up the properties at Chartwell. Now they're buying in the Amosite to Dunder Rave area because you know, it's amazing how that area has changed so much. I mean, I love the property because there's lots of half acre lots. You got the great views, but a lot of people moved out of the properties because they wanted to be able to walk to school and the, and the Amosite lots they bought there. That everything's closer, so it does change. That's why I need to. Ch- I do the check each year because I want to know. Every area I'm in, but who, you know, who do I push to s- s- sell a house to? I can tell you, high-end apartment, uh, Iranians are buying our, our high-end waterfront apartments up. It's, it's amazing. It's a different, because the other range we had in 1982, they were here, but they bought in areas that were 
less price in the properties they bought in the Glenmore area, which is the top of the properties. It's called Glenmore, but it's, it's the top of the British property. But now, the, 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 the new crop is buying up the best streets, the best uh, waterfront apartments. So, there's a change, and it's interesting to, to, to see all, all that change. It's, you know, you get used to de- de- dealing with all the, the cultures. You know how they all work. And, you know, you just have to handle a totally def- different one culture to the other one. With current governments taking people's rights away, are you seeing people selling their properties to move to another country? No, I haven't seen that. I know it's, I'm in the States, they're moving to Florida. I mean, I, I'm a very, I love politics. I have it on, it's in my home, it's on, the news is on all day long. And it shocks me what's going on there because all my friends said, well, it's not going to, it's not going to happen in Canada. What's well, happening in Canada too? So North America is going through it. A change right now. So from state to state, they're moving out of New York, they're moving out of California, going to Florida. So we haven't, I haven't seen any, I haven't seen one client yet think of that they're going to, I've had a couple complain about what's going on here, but uh, nobody has moved, has been moved away that I, uh, uh, that I've heard of. Are the COVID restrictions making day to day business more difficult for realtors? It was last, it was last year. It was last year for the first part of the year. Um, because, uh, 218 was the worst year. 219 was the second year. And I said, I've been a realtor since 1970. My, 1980, my dad's go, go, I go back to. So they were the worst two years. Like the, the worst year before was 454, which was two, uh, 208. We were down to 321. And then, then the next year, which was just over 400. But it, it affected us a lot for the first half. In fact, by, by the end of August, it looked like that was going to be the third worst year we we ever had. So it'd be three years in a row. But what happened in fall, the inventory was so low, the market it picked up. So all of a sudden, we had a lot more sales. So it went from the third worst year to the sixth worst year by the end of the last four months, moved from third to sixth. January, it was off to messy. March was great. But, you know, I told people in January, I said, okay, here's what's going to happen. There's fewer houses now than we've had for a long time starting the year. So there will be a, a big increase for sure. So you find, you're going to find by springtime the market will slow down. And it, and sure enough, it did. But uh, and that's the normal. But I said at least we were just 50 sales shy of being the average in the number of sales. But that's so important to, to know that because... I said, I did, the, the, I got a fire. They said, oh, near record n- number of sales. Well, if, if I'm a homeowner, I look at the realtor. Well, he's, well, he's, you know, he's one of the top guys in the area. He must know. You're going to think your house is worth more. Same as your tax assessment. Everybody wants to increase up. And so many people say, see, my house just went up $700,000. Well, it didn't go, it didn't go up 700000 It's on the market and hasn't sold. Just because your assessment, assessments move up, um, yeah, you know, move up seven hundred thousand doesn't mean the house will. I'll like, just give you an example how the assessments can work, because we we never bothered with assessments most of my career. When the the Chinese arrived, they be, the assessment became important because their the government controls everything there, so they think well whatever the the government says, I guess that's what my house is worth. I, I had a brand new house built in the Eagle Harbor area, brand new, a beautiful view. I put it on for five nine. The assessments were four four. So the first offer I had on it was four four from a Chinese group. And I said to the man, listen, let's get our assessments increased. Because a lot of people look at assessment value now and these are too low because it doesn't indicate what the house is worth. So it took us two months to do that. They jumped from four four to to five six. I had two offers on that house. It went over the asking price. All three groups were Chinese. So it just shows you how change in assessment value affected the buyers. What are developers of high-end homes doing? Well, they're, they have picked up a lot, as you said, because we, we had more this year than we've had in years. So uh, the buyers are coming around and, and buy. I mean, 16, 16, oh, you know, 16 houses, 16 houses over over 10 million, and more waterfronts than than we've had in years. So I mean. Really, it's a, we're optimistic. It's stable. 
people are tired of the of the virus. I mean, we we were locked up. We couldn't do this. Close the offices. But people have said, okay, then what's the everything the government says? It seems to be wrong, especially in the states. Everything their president said, he doesn't have a clue what he's talking. If they're wrong all the time, they're absolutely incorrect. And people are saying the heck with it. You look at their sports sports stadiums. I think that. 80,000 people are the car in no mass. They're taking a chance because this new virus isn't uh, anywhere near like the, the old one. So I think pe- people are tired of being locked up. I mean, everybody lost the money. We had the two worst year in history and, I, and then all of a sudden they got the virus and so really it's been tough. So we're coming back to, to, to normal. So those are very positive things. I think the bank is going to increase the rates, but I mean, still they're low. I mean, you, you were probably around when I was when they were, 18 and 19 percent so it, i never thought they'd get down to 10 so it's uh everything seems to be on the plus side i don't think the i don't think the housing market is going to skyrocket to the best year ever but my guess is it'll be probably i'll be talking to a, a year from now and and uh i'm hoping we'll get 700 and, and some sales that's what i'm hoping for but yeah. still the best year and the, be- and the interesting thing about the best year, the best year in the lower mainland, it's a year you will not, 1989. 1989, we had 1,201 sales in West Van. 86, we had the fair here. Expo was here. Everybody came. They wanted to move here. So t- two or three years ago, things. So you look at West Van, 1,201 sales, 1989. You look at Richmond and the West Side, they both had over 2,800 sales at 1,900. Since 1989, the highest year is 2,200. So it shows you how far we still haven't caught up to 1989. That's how strong Hong Kong come, come, coming over and a few others. That's how it changed the market. But with all the construction that's gone on, you would think in the house, I mean, the areas have changed, you know, it's been expanded all over. I can't get over that. 1989 was still the best year in our history. See, most of the, real, the realtors were, I mean, just, just put all the realtors weren't, weren't around that. Some of them being, most of them being in the business six or seven years. So that, you know, they, they, uh, 208 was the worst year. They probably started or started around then. And so they think the market, you know, the, the market's okay. But it really, when you look at the West Side, still 600 below the best year at Richmond, the same. So, what strict, when you look at the history of our business, it's amazing. And you look at different areas in the West Side or different areas in West Vancouver, it's shocking. It's shocking how a difference, two or three, three blocks can change, your market can change. I mean, that's why this job is so exciting. I love doing my stats. I mean, I have a choice. I, I just got, this year, I didn't have a great year because I got a new knee in March. I couldn't even walk. So, you know, I've been home, but now I got my knee. I've had it for a couple of months. So now I'm looking forward to playing golf next year and all the rest. But uh, I'm looking forward to this year. I can't wait to get back because I'm at the point in my career when they would think, well, Alan's been around so long. He, he doesn't want to work. I love working. I guarantee you no re- realtor spends more hours than I do because no realtor will spend 25 hours a week analyzing the market so you can tell the people the truth. Because what the realtors say, it's always, it's not the real facts because they don't know how to, nobody's going to look at stats every day and see what day it actually sold even though the board said we had 48 sales at this month 20 of them maybe from the month before the month before for that so i go through every sale to make sure that i know exactly how many sales were in that month because the market ch- changes so quick, quickly up or down you can't be looking at four months old sales just because they, they just have to be reported in the month of January, but they could have been sold in September, October. The real builders are supposed to have, to have them in, but, uh, they don't, you know, if you got a six month fall on calls and you put it in your bag. And, Cause I used to be there when I was doing a hundred over a hundred deals a year, I might handle in eight, nine, ten deals at the same time. I wish I could do that now. If people are planning on selling, should they be listing now? It's, I think if you have, yeah, because it's a straight, it's always the same thing. Every year, springtime's the strongest time. It slows down in the summertime because most people try and have a holiday in the summertime, school's out, and it picks up in the fall, but the spring is always the strength. So most people start to list about the end of January, February, and, and hopefully, 
you know, but they all start overpriced. And they're all going to see their tax assessments are higher, so they're all going to put their houses on to, uh, too high. So it'll be a couple of months before they realize, well, it hasn't sold at that. I better adjust the price. You go through this year after year. Now, the, you know, last couple of years are different because of the virus, but we're getting back to normal. So yes, uh, but you know, if you want to wait three or four months to have it sold, you put it on the price you want, but the true price will come around in the next 60 to, to 90 days. The federal government uh, quietly keeps floating the idea of a home equity tax. What's your thoughts on that? Don't we already pay enough taxes on our homes? Listen, I am I had a call from the government a while ago, and it was on money laundering. No, that's the money is made by whatever it is, sex trades or gambling, whatever it is. Then they bang it over here, and they're trying to stop that in, in, in all business. And he wanted to know how how I could how I could help. I said, "Well, I can tell you, I mean, all the deals I've done, I'm, I just get a check for. for I haven't had, I haven't had a cash cash money in in my life. It's a check a, a check from one of the banks, Bank of Montreal, HSBC, where it's from. So I I don't know. And, and if they're a foreign buyer, they're not buying. They come in and they they you know. Then now it's an Iranian coming or a Chinese. They deal with Iranian Chinese. So." I don't know who the, the people are. I just sell, sell the houses. So uh, yes, it uh, it 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 does. It has an effect, but uh, as I said, it's, it's we just have to be be careful because I told this guy, look, as far as I as I'm concerned, the only really corrupt corporation in in the Canada is the, the, the government itself. You know, if, if we if they happen to spend the money here. It's a terrible thing where it comes from, but the fact of the matter is we get more house sale, more jewelry sale, more car sales. And so you got to decide, do I want a better economy for me or do I want them to go to Seattle and spend the money? So it's it's very, very tough. And I don't know how, I mean, the the bank should be the one who who control where the money comes because a, a realtor has no idea. We don't know. The guys that I've had, most of my clients are my old clients. They come back to me. My biggest client, I've done 64 sales with one client. My biggest agent client uh, 32 houses she, uh, she's bought so they, they stay with the real the, you know, the government has new laws there's new superintendent of real estate i mean honest a good a lawyer from newfoundland labrador has come into town and changed all the rules and he's, he's ripped the heart out of her i try and make it fun to buy a house but even i am nervous because i don't know the changes are going every so often and none of them help them none of them help the market at all this this spelling out uh, 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 out stuff you don't you know it's too much it's too that's too hard to people most people are nervous about buying a house in the first place then you got to sit down there for an hour and a half and explain all these rules what they mean it makes them nervous to buy so all of a sudden they're 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 hesitant maybe we shouldn't be doing this so if they think that they have helped our, our business they haven't they've it, they've ripped the heart out of our business every change I look at that man should never have been made superintendent. He was a lawyer from Newfoundland Labrador. Now he's a, he's the head of our business here. And every change he does, I think, well, that's just a waste. And we all think the, the same way. All think the same way. Government is stepping in, want to take charge of everything we have. And you and I know, or most of us know, they're the worst people to be in charge. If you you let the people in the states say take charge, they're trying to get charge of every, every aspect of our life. It's going to get worse. It's the same here, exactly. So, no, I, I'm not a fan of the, the government at all. Alan, how can people get a hold of you? It's uh, uh, Angel Hasman is the name of the county, but the, the easiest way is by email, alanmarkangel at gmail.com, Alan, A-L-L-A-N, Mark, M-A-R-K, Angel, A-N-G-E-L-L, so alanmarkangel at gmail.com. Okay, that... Uh, the, the, that's how I give it. Or my phone number is easy: seven seven eight 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 seven four seven four. And I don't care where, where you. It's amazing how often I do a podcast. I get people coming from Alberta, and I sell them places here. So I don't care where they come from. I love to just chat. What's going on in the housing market? Alan, thank you so much for being on this week in money. Good. I hope I can help everybody. Thank you kindly. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Bye bye. My guest has been Alan Mark Angel, one of the top realtors in Canada. He has sold more than 
4,000 properties. He spoke to us from West Vancouver. You can contact him by going to his website, theangelgroup.com, A-N-G-E-L-L group.com. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Eric Haddock, and Alan Mark Angel. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show or our guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Now stand by for a company showcase update from American Manganese CEO and President Larry Ray. I'm Jim Goddard. I'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. Welcome back to Company Showcase, Larry. Thanks, Jim. Larry, uh, all the experts I've talked to say there isn't enough copper or lithium around to supply all the electric car batteries that are expected to be needed in the future. Recycling appears to be one of the, the great hopes to make sure we have enough of these metals, is it not? Well, you would uh, definitely think so. I mean, uh, rather than going into a uh, slag heap somewhere, it uh, should go back into the battery. And, uh, you know, that would alleviate some of the demand that's made on the mining of the material. So, yeah, we have, uh, you know, we think that recycling is the answer. It may not be immediate, but it... Uh, over the long term will be the answer to uh, shortages of uh, of the critical metals and uh, it'll also uh, you know clean up the environment so that's two shots with one bullet and that's it and uh, so many uh, companies and countries have expressed interest in your recycling efforts can you tell us about that well, we've got lots of uh, companies from all over the world that are looking at our uh, our process and doing a deep dive on it, and uh, and I'm pretty sure that uh, there will be deals to be made this year, but uh, that'll have to be wait to be seen. But as you saw, Jim, uh, it's been a pretty good year, except for the last half a week. For uh, American manganese, is it uh, went up over sixty percent. And, uh, you know, it's been uh, going up and uh, you get new buyers in and that's that's uh, critical to the, you know, to the future of our company. It's, uh, you know, getting more shareholders involved. And uh, so that's been that's been an exciting time. Although, you know, I've been off with uh, pneumonia and I'll tell you, that's something you don't want to play around with and... Uh, you know, it's uh, really debilitated me, but uh, I'm trying to get back on my feet now. So if I sound a little bit uh, ludicrous, uh, maybe it's uh, got to do with pneumonia. But the uh, that is uh, one thing you don't want to play around with, especially when you're uh, 70 plus. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it can be fatal. So uh, you got to be careful. And, uh, you know, it... Uh, it's, you know, the greatest thing that you've got going for you, Jim, is your organization. If you've got a good organization, if you've got uh, good people in place and everything else, the companies can keep running. And, uh, you know, it, uh, that's one thing we put together. Everybody's, uh, can do part of everybody else's job. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great to have uh, a reliable team that you can rely on, and uh, certainly on the research side, uh, Cometco, whom I could never say enough about. Uh, you know, they uh, they're on, on top of the uh, curve when it comes to uh, recycling. Uh, they've, they've spent the last five years with us uh, working on a recycling project, and uh, we feel it's uh, it's it's a great thing to happen. Now, that's, uh, that's, looks after the uh, R&D part of it, and 
uh, you know, making sure that we get the right tools involved and the right methods involved to uh, process the material and come out with, uh, you know, as little as possible when it comes to the and contaminating the environment or as little as possible when it comes to uh, um, losses of metals. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think we've got a, a, a great formula uh, for its time. It's probably one of the greatest, but, uh, you know, that's what we strive for, and uh, we spent millions of dollars to get there. We've been very transparent about getting there. We've uh, shown all our results. Uh, and uh, although there are certain people out there that uh, that have, you know, poo-pooed our results, uh, I don't know what they're basing that on. So, uh, and it doesn't matter to me what they're basing it on. It's, uh, we're not poo-pooing our results, and we've been peer-reviewed. And so what can I say? It's... Uh, it's uh it's it's a process that's uh come into its own and um now we're working on our demonstration plant you know that's going to be a big big plus for us that'll bring a lot more eyeballs onto the company and uh we'll be producing uh, materials that can be put back into batteries and uh, let's hope that that's exactly the path that we're taking Larry, for people new to American Manganese, what's the company all about, and where are you trading? Well, American Manganese is uh, is a critical metal company that uh, uh, got involved with manganese back in uh, back in two thousand and eight, and we developed a process for dealing with very low grades of manganese, which the U.S. has, and uh, we hope to be able to solve the problem of uh, you know building out a manganese supply, whether it's electrolytic or or uh, whether it's just pure manganese, uh, you know, for the nation. Because, uh, you know, one of the things that I always say is you can't make steel without manganese and you can't make steel, the world stops. So, and we've moved on now to recycling batteries and, uh, you know, we've had great successes at that and uh, it's... Uh, you know, it's it's been uh, it's been a steady work. It's not something that you just uh, you know do a bit here and a bit there. You got to do get steady, consistent work to make sure that your process works. If people want more information, where should they go? They can go to our website at AmericanManganeseInc.com. dot uh, com. They can uh, uh, email me at l r e a u g h at a m y m n dot they can phone us at uh, 778-574-4444, and uh, we'll give them all the information that they require. Larry, thank you so much for chatting with us, and get well soon. Uh, I hope I'm on the, on the mend here, Jim, so uh, I'd like to get back into the office. Uh, I feel guilty about not being there, but I, I don't want to go there too soon, make everybody else sick. Yeah, that sort of thing. My guest has been Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on January 21st. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.